Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you guys this weekend, and uh, thanks for being here. Welcome, everybody watching online uh, all over the place. Thanks for uh, taking time to, to join together uh, with your church family and be connected. So grateful for that. I, uh, I love uh, what just happened. I'm thinking of all you parents who just dedicated your, your children. I'm sitting down there. I'm getting old. I know I'm young and sexy looking, but on the inside, I'm old. And... Um, I'm sitting there and I'm watching this band and I'm realizing most of the people in this band were dedicated as children like your children just were. And you should clap for that. Somebody, yeah, that's huge. So I, I want you guys to understand like when, when we stand as a church and we make a commitment to these families that we will teach their children and we'll coach them in basketball and we will build the buildings that we need to build for them and we will lead their small groups and their mission trips. We mean it. And we've meant that for a long time and, and, and we've been around an old, long enough now. Grace is 21 years old this year. So we've been around long enough that these kids aren't kids anymore. And here they are leading, these little babies we held are leading us in worship. It's just a powerful, powerful thing. So be encouraged because sometimes you're gonna really think, Lord, what have you done to me? That's the way parenting works. And then other times you're gonna look and see what God is good. So I just love that. I just love that. It's awesome. So uh, we're in a series right now that we call uh, Resolved. And uh, in this series, we're talking about this concept of being resolved. And we said that if you want to accomplish anything in your life, uh, you wanna excel at academics or sports or music or marriage or anything, uh, there's a point that you're gonna have to resolve yourself. You're gonna have to kind of plant your feet, so to say, and look and say, I am giving myself to that. And I'm going to allow my life to be kind of driven in that way. And that same principle holds true spiritually. Uh, maturity in Christ and knowing and following God isn't something that you stumble into. It's not something that just kind of like magically happens around you. There's a point where you have to resolve yourself, where you look and say, I am going to allow my life to be defined and directed by Christ. And I'm going to pursue knowing God's word. I'm gonna live by God's truth. And that is what I am going to to do, and we've been talking about that. And we said that's, that's important and, cr and critical because of who we are. So if, if you are a follower of Jesus, uh, this is what the Bible says is true of you, that when you accepted Christ, the Bible says your sins are forgiven. Uh, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit's been given to you as a seal and a guarantee on your place in heaven. And then one of the other things that we don't always think about a lot, the Bible says that you have been called out You've been called out of what the Bible called the world. I often call it our culture. So you've been called out of the world and you've been made a citizen of heaven. In fact, that's what the, the term church means. It means the called out ones, the gathering of the called out ones, right? And so the Bible says that when we're called out and made a, citizenship, uh, made a citizen of heaven, that our identity changes. And we become, uh, Peter says, a holy nation, a righteous people, a people belonging to God, God's chosen possession. And then our citizenship becomes grounded and rooted in heaven. So I am a resident of what the Bible would call the world or the planet, but I'm a citizen of heaven. And Peter says, that's super duper to remember that because it, it frames the way that you think about how you live life here on earth. He says it this way in 1 Peter chapter two. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So Peter's like, guys, don't forget Christ followers. It's only for Christ followers. You, you think of yourself spiritually as a foreigner and exile and you live in a culture not just that is different or that is tainted, but actually a culture that wages war against your soul. That's the way of what the Bible would call the world. And so we've said, boy, if, if we know that, and that's the reality of it, then that means we have to resolve that I'm gonna yield myself to Christ. I'm gonna give my life to following and knowing him. We're not gonna run into that because we live in a place that doesn't celebrate any of that. 
So we have to decide that we're gonna give ourselves to it. And what that means then is as a Christ follower, the Bible would say that we are called to live in attention. Citizens, my heart, my mind are placed on things above, but my body and my ministry effort or my mission in life is here on the planet. So I live in attention. I'm not to be defined by the culture, but I am to serve people who are defined by the culture. Uh, I'm not to find my value in the culture, but I love people who do find their value in the culture. The culture is not to have authority over me, but I am to honor those who have authority within the culture. I'm here to be, the metaphors the Bible uses as salt and light or influencers of the culture. I'm here to be an ambassador for Jesus as if he himself were making his appeal through me. I'm here to do that but this is not my home and it's not where I find my identity or my value. But I love all the people who are here because I want them to know the same hope in Christ that I have. So we live in this tension. So we've been taking the last few weeks and we've been looking at, I I call them the boys. We've been looking at the boys and it's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they had to live in this same tension and they really modeled for us how to do that and how to do that well. Uh, The boys were raised in Jerusalem and in the Old Testament, the heart and the mind of God was kind of in Jerusalem, specifically around the temple. So the boys were raised around the heart and the mind of God. They were educated in that. That was their norm and that's what they had given their life to. The Bible says that God gave Jerusalem over to this other kingdom called Babylon. In the Old Testament, Jerusalem is a literal place. Babylon was a literal place and Babylon was not different, it was opposed. It was the antithesis of everything that is Jerusalem. And so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are taken as captives into Babylon. They are gone, they are put in a three-year re-education class so that they would become Babylonians and value what the Babylonians value. But in the middle of all that, the Bible says that they resolved not to defile themselves. They said, we understand that we are citizens of Jerusalem, but we are residents of Babylon and we are going to honor and serve and give our lives to the God of Jerusalem and not be sucked into this even while we exist in it. And so we've looked at their lives and kind of that pattern in their lives for the last few weeks. Courage, this is one of those series that it's maybe worth the catch up on it, right? So there's the app, there's the podcast, there's the website. If you buy me sushi, I'll come and re-preach the sermon for you. Like it's kind of all right there. It may be worth it because we're kind of going through their story a little bit. And we're gonna land in their story in Daniel chapter five here this weekend. So notes and references are there on the app if you wanna use that. If you wanna use the Bibles that are in the chairs, if you're here live in the room, it's page 724. And we've been watching how these patterns of Babylon and patterns of Jerusalem play out. So I told you in the Bible, uh, Babylon is a literal place, Jerusalem is a literal place. But in the Bible, both these places also become metaphors. They become representations. So Jerusalem is kind of the metaphor of the heart and the mind of God and his law and his truth and his love and his justice. And Babylon, especially at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, becomes the metaphor for everything opposed to God. Kind of the seed of the evil one and all that he would espouse and want us to be trapped by. So this patterns of Jerusalem, metaphorically of the people of God, and the patterns of Babylon, metaphorically of the world around us, we've been looking at these two things and trying to figure them out and trying to understand how they relate into our lives a little bit. Daniel chapter five is where I want us to go this week. And we're gonna hang out here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk us through Daniel chapter five a little bit. I edited it down in my notes for the sake of time. But as always, I encourage you to read every word of this on your own. You'll never waste your time in God's word. It's always a good investment. So I'll let you do that on your own. But for our conversation, we'll kind of go through this in a truncated way. Let me frame it up for you a little bit, okay? Nebuchadnezzar 
was the king of Babylon who overtook Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar has died. His son ruled for a while, and now his grandson is on the throne. This would be kind of the easiest way to explain how this happened. So this is 30 years later. Daniel chapter five is 30 years after Daniel chapter four. And a lot has kind of uh, happened in this time. And now we're at this place, and the person ruling Babylon is a guy named Belshazzar, and the simplest way to understand it is he is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Verse one, chapter five, Daniel, many years later, so 30 years, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for 1,000 of his nobles and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver cups from his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar that he had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple and while they drank from them, they praised their gods, their idols, made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So let's just frame it. Nebuchadnezzar took over Jerusalem. One of the things he did is he raided the temple. And the Bible says he took sacred items from the temple and he went and he put them in the storehouse of sacred items with his gods, right? So he shoved all that in there. Now, the reason that the Bible mentions that is because the temple is a big, big deal in the Old Testament. The temple was the representation of the presence and the truth and the heart and the mind of God. The temple was so important to God that if you go to 2 Chronicles chapter three and chapter four, you'll see that God actually gave very, very detailed list of how to build the temple. How the temple was to be built and everything that was in the temple. So God said, I want it to look like this and I want all of its furnishings to be handcrafted in these ways because the building and the stuff in it represents my heart and my mind. That's why the building and the stuff in it is sacred. It's not like a normal building. It's not like this building. The building itself was kind of a sacred and holy thing because you understood God through the temple and through the furnishings of the temple. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar's grandpa, grabbed that stuff, threw it into the storehouse of his gods, and now Belshazzar has called for those sacred things that, rec- that uh, point us to the heart and mind of God. And he's brought them into this feast and he's drinking out of them and he's pouring drinks from them. Why would he do that? Right? That's the big question. Why would he do that? Here's why. We know from extra biblical history Right? So the Bible is, sits in and then there's all this archaeology and stuff that's around it. We know from extra biblical history that at this point in history, Babylon was being sieged, being attacked by the empire of the uh, Medes and the Persians. And we know that at this point in history, the Medes and the Persians had attacked a Babylonian town. So you got the Babylon, the city, and the empire, like Rome. You got Rome, the city, Roman empire. A Babylonian town was wiped out by the Medes and the Persians, and they were on their way to the capital, to Babylon. They were on their way to the capital of Babylon, and Belshazzar, the king, was desperate because he knew that this opposing empire was gonna invade his capital city any moment and they would depose him, execute him, and Belshazzar the king and Babylon the kingdom would fall if that happened. So this festival is most likely a pagan worship service. So in pagan worship at the time, there was lots and lots of sexual perversion, there was lots and lots of idol worship, and there was lots and lots of kind of drinking and sexual perversion around that. And one of the things that you would do to honor your God 
is you would take a sacred cup and you would pour sacred wine into it and then you would give a, a drink offering. You would pour that cup out onto the idol. You would offer that wine to that God. And I believe pretty strongly that that's what was happening here. And Belshazzar was desperate. And so he looked at his nobles and said, get all the lucky stuff we can get. Go into the storehouse of all these different nations and we captured all their sacred stuff from all their gods and let's throw everything to the gods that we can possibly do because they have to bail us out of this impending invasion which is literally at our doorsteps. And so that is the festival and that's what was happening. And in the middle of that festival, something freaky and supernatural happens. A hand appears, the Bible says, verse five. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on, pla on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote and his face turned pale with fright his knees knocked together in fear and his legs gave way beneath him. Verse seven, the king shouted for the astrologers to be brought before him. Verse eight, but when all the king's men had come in, none of them could read the writing or tell him what it meant. So the king grew even more alarmed and his face turned pale. His nobles too were shaken. Why was the king freaking out? The king wasn't freaking out just because a hand appeared in midair, although that is a really solid reason to freak out. Like, so he, that, but that's not the only thing going on. The hand shows up and it writes. You ever heard the phrase, can you see the writing on the wall? That's where that comes from here, right? So the hand shows up and it writes on the wall. Here's the deal. In the ancient world, the symbol of a defeated enemy was a cut off hand. You would overthrow a kingdom and you would cut the hands off of your enemy. So when Belshazzar and his nobles saw this, not only is it freaky that a hand appears and writes on the wall, but when they saw that symbol, they knew exactly what it meant. We are defeated, right? And that sign of defeat says something. We've been asking the gods for a symbol and we got one. And it wrote something on the wall, but we don't know what it wrote. The hand writes on the wall, everybody freaks out, and Belshazzar's mom hears them freaking out. Verse 10, but when the queen mother heard what was happening, she hurried to the banquet hall. She said to Belshazzar, there is a man in your kingdom who has within him the spirit of the holy gods during Nebuchadnezzar's reign. When grandpa was king, this man was found to have insight, understanding, and wisdom like that of the gods. This man, Daniel, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, solve problems, Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. All right, now let's capture this. This is important. Everybody's freaking out. Mom comes in. She looks at her son, the king, and she says, there's a guy named Daniel. Now think about this. A chapter ago, Daniel was a ruler in Babylon. He had prestige, he had power, he had wealth. In that 30 year span, Daniel, whatever happened, we don't really, we don't know. Daniel was so removed from power and prestige and wealth that the current king didn't even know who he was. His mom had heard her grandpa and grandma talk about him. Babylon had moved so far away from the fiery furnace and so far away from Daniel interpreting dreams that there wasn't even a memory of Daniel or the one true God that he served. Daniel comes in, verse 13, so Daniel was brought before the king. 
king offered him money, power, wealth, robes. Daniel's like, nah, that's okay, bro. You can keep it. Verse 18, he says this. He says, your majesty, listen, the most high God gave sovereignty, majesty, glory, and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that the people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him in fear. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from the royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal. He ate grass like a cow and he was, he was drenched with the dew of the heavens until he learned that the most high God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. Daniel said, Belshazzar, listen, your grandpa, your grandpa became arrogant and the Bible accounts for this in the chapters before. And one day, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar's grandpa, was walking out. And he looked around. And he's like, you know what? You know who's awesome? Nebuchadnezzar's awesome. That's who's awesome. I'm a great ruler. I created this. I am in charge of this. I am worthy of worship. And God was, looked at Nebuchadnezzar and said, uh, hang on a second there, bud. And the Lord inflicted him with a mental illness and he went out and he roamed the fields and he grazed with the cattle for seven years. And then the Bible says one day he came to his senses and he learned that he was always secondary to the most high God and God healed him and restored him. That's what Daniel is talking about. And then he looked at Nebuchadnezzar uh, or at Belshazzar and he said, listen, Belshazzar, you are his successor and you knew all of this, yet you have not humbled yourself. You have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and earth and have had these cups from his temple brought before you. You have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. So God sent this message with his hand. And this is what the words mean, numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and, not, and have not measured up. Divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, the Babylonian king was killed and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Wow. Right. It's an amazing story. And in this story, God did it to show the kingdom of Babylon and the kingdom of Jerusalem and you and I, who he is, what he asked for from us and some guidance on how to live for him. I wanna make some observations, all right? We're talking about the patterns of Jerusalem and the patterns of Babylon. I want us to see some things that might show up in our lives even today. Here's the first observation I make out of it, ready? Here's this. When Babylon is desperate, the wisdom of Babylon is deficient. When Babylon is desperate, the wisdom of Babylon is deficient. Babylon is anything that is not Christ. That's how we'd say it in the New Testament. Anything that is not God's word. It's the world or the culture around us. And when Babylon is desperate, the wisdom of Babylon is always deficient. I find it fascinating that Belshazzar turned to the thought, turned to the leaders, turned to the philosophers, and turned to the very practices that put him in a place of desperation. He turned to the people and the ideas that caused the desperation to give him hope and relief from the desperation. And that's a pattern of Babylon. Babylon will become desperate. And when Babylon is desperate, its wisdom will always be found deficient. When a culture lacks wisdom, it's illogical that that culture that drove itself to a place of desperation would then look to itself to have answers to the desperation. 
But the pattern of Babylon is always that. Babylon always looks to Babylon to fix the messes that Babylon created. The people of God are very different, or we should be. The people of God always look to God. We set our mind on things above, our heart on things above. Colossians says we have the mind of Christ, we have the heart of Christ, we have the truth of Christ, we have the word of God. So when we are desperate, we don't look to the very sources that drove our desperation for answers. We look to strength and wisdom and power and truth outside of the cycles that Babylon would create for us. And when you know that, you start asking yourself like some logical questions, right? You start thinking some things through. So you might think a question like this, how can politics heal the division that politics created? It's impossible. Why would we look to politicians, the present guy, the last guy, the guy before that, 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 pick your team, why would we look to the very systems that created the fractures within us to heal us? That's a Babylonian way of thinking. And for the people of God to look and say, if my guy got elected or since my guy did, now somehow God is gonna show up differently is not the way the people of Jerusalem would think. We would think, my God is always the one who rules my guy. And my God sets the guy up. And if I want unity and healing and help and change, I don't look to the guy. I look to the God who establishes kingdom and tears them down and raises them up again. See? Here's a question. How can a culture heal and help the children that we introduce pain to? You know, the average boy will see his first pornographic image by the time he's nine, and the average girl will see her first pornographic image by the time she's 11. So for a culture that abuses our own children by pumping out pornography, we're the leading propagator of pornography on planet Earth, why would we look to that same culture to give us help or healing or direction about our morality or our sexuality? They're the source of the desperation. So if we were looking for that direction, wouldn't we look outside the source of the pain? See? But that's the pattern of Babylon. Babylon looks to Babylon to solve the problems that Babylon created. How can our culture solve the very injustices that we participated in? Why would we look to our culture for equality and justice and reconciliation when our culture drove inequality, un injustice, and division? What, wouldn't we look outside of that as the people of God? and find a different path, a greater truth? Why would we rely on the mechanisms for solutions, the same mechanisms that caused the problems in the first place? I was reading a, um, a research article the other day and it talked about teenagers and social media. And it said uh, teenagers interacting with social media, the more that a teenager interacts with social media, the more their anxiety, the rates of anxiety and the rates of depression go up. So they kind of did it by the hours. And so the more hours you spend, they go up. So up to 50% more, up to 100% more with depression. By the way, I think that's also true of adults, to be honest with you. 
But the more we interact with social media, the more we're dissatisfied, the more we're restless, the more our anxiety goes up because we interact with social media and our depression goes up because we interact with social media. But this is the part I found fascinating. When someone on social media feels anxious or depressed, the number one thing that they do is they Google solutions for anxiety and depression through social media. Social media that caused it now I'm asking social media to give me the solution to it, see? That's a Babylonian way of thinking. And when Babylon is desperate, its wisdom is always deficient. Belshazzar, his worship of false gods, the perversion of the Babylonian culture, the wickedness of the Babylonian culture, and here we are practicing all of it, trying to get ourselves bailed out while the enemy's at the gate. And the people of God, God would look and say, yeah, guys, that's Babylon. I mean, that's the way it works. Nothing wrong with Babylon. But the people of Jerusalem think differently, value differently, trust the truth of the God that they worship. Another thing I observed was this, it's this, that Proverbs 16, 18 is eternally true. Proverbs 16, 18 is eternally true. That's a great, if you were gonna get a new tattoo, you should get that one. Proverbs 16, 18 is eternally true, like right on your face. You should get that one, it'd be awesome, right? So what, what does Proverbs 16, 18 say? Here's what it says. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before the fall. That is true. That has always been true. It's always gonna be true. It's the truest thing you can ever write down and that's why you should get a face tattoo of it. Because that's the way that it works. Pride always goes before destruction and haughtiness always goes before the fall. And that's exactly what was happening here in Babylon. Daniel showed up, Belshazzar's freaking out. He says, I wanna know what's going on. And Daniel says, all right, bro, I'll tell you, but it's a tough tough truth. Are you ready to hear it? Yeah, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. Okay. All right. First of all, remember grandpa? Grandpa became arrogant and he became self-centered. That's what grandpa did. And you remember grandpa? Remember when everybody was like, grandpa's a cow. You remember that? See? That was God interacting with grandpa because Proverbs 16, 18 is always true. And until grandpa learned that the most high God rules over the kings of the earth and appoints, every, uh, appoints anyone he desires to rule over them, until he humbled himself, grandpa grazed. When he humbled himself, he was restored. Remember that, Belshazzar? Yeah, I remember that. All right, Belshazzar, you are his successor and you knew all this. When the king of Babylon is grazing around like a cow, people know. Like that goes in the history books. That's carved in the stone. You learned about that in the third grade, right? It became a threat. Do you want to be a cow? Like that, that's the way that works. You knew all of this, yet you have not humbled yourself. For you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven. You've not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. Daniel, he's not being a jerk here. He's not like, oh, I told you. He's not doing any of that kind of stuff. He's like, Belshazzar, buddy, <sighs> Proverbs 16, 18 is always true. Like you cannot beat that. That does not go away. Remember your grandpa? See, it's always true. And now it's true for you. And you knew it. And your reaction to God being God was to proudly defy him. See? Now this is true. Proverbs 16, 18 is true. Kingdoms, nations. Remember Daniel's talking to a king. So it's true. Kingdoms and nations. It's true of you and me. And Daniel's looking at Belshazzar. He's like, hey, king of Babylon, this is true for you, but Belshazzar, grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, this is true of you. That if you set your will against God, 
you will find destruction. If you are puffed up with your own self-importance, you will fall. It's always going to happen. See, When we do not engage and we do not look and say, I, I resolve myself. I'm going to be defined and directed by Christ. When I look at Christ and say, I know you're God. I know you're king. I know, I know, I know. I'm not doing that. I'm going to proudly defy. Belshazzar didn't accidentally defy. Belshazzar wasn't looking for truth and struggling to find it. Belshazzar wasn't even fighting an addiction or a weakness. He proudly defied the most high God. And there's only one place that that lands. Every time. See? And Daniel looked at Belshazzar and said, Belshazzar, th- this is why you are where you are. See? Belshazzar wants Daniel to read the words on the wall. Daniel says, okay, I'll do that. Here's the third thing I observed, ready? Ready? Judgment is earned and grace is free. What's on the wall? What's on the wall? What's on the wall, Daniel? Tell me what's on the wall. All right, bro, here's what's on the wall. This is what the words mean, numbered, Belshazzar, numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Belshazzar, I set you up and I take you down and I'm done. You have proudly defied me, see? You know, the Bible says God knits us together in our mother's womb. God knows when you're gonna be born. The Bible also says he holds your very breath in his hands. He knows, God knows when you're gonna die. That's why we should live with courage, by the way. All right, you're not gonna die until God decides you're gonna die. So going on a missions trip or standing up for the Lord, that's all Jesus' business. You're fine. But Daniel looked at Belshazzar and said, God said, I'm done. I am numbering your days and I am drawing them to the end. Numbered, weighed. You've been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. The Bible says that every person who lives God is watching us. He keeps track of our life. And he's not doing that so that he can get us because Jesus said in John 3, 17, that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus isn't watching your life to gain evidence so that he can punish you. You've given him plenty. He came to love you and help you and rescue you from your sin, but he knows your sin. And God looked at Belshazzar and said, you've been weighed, man. And as I put, not not your little stuff. I saw one time you cheated, one time you stole, one time you cheered for Michigan, one time you were, you rooted for Alabama. Like it's not these little things, right? It's the defiance of your heart. You knew, you wanted, you mocked. I've looked at the direction of your life and the scales are tipped. Come on, Belshazzar. Well, I didn't mean to. Yeah, Belshazzar. I'm a really good guy. Belshazzar. Well, I was just a... Belshazzar. Done. You've been weighed. You've been numbered. And the third word was divided. The way that we would say that is judged. I've reached a conclusion. I've reached a conclusion that the life I've given you, you are are squandering and you're not investing it for me. I I have weighed the evidence of your life. Your, Your life is a life of defiance of me. You're not wrestling through the Christian life is how we would say it today. You just don't give a rip. And I brought you to a place of judgment today, Belshazzar, your kingdom will be taken from you. The Bible says that every single human being will stand before God in judgment. We will give an account for our lives. We will be numbered. We will be weighed. 
and we will be judged. And judgment is earned, right? We like to think that we'll stand before God. I'm a, I, I didn't mean to, really, Jeff, really. Oh, I, I just, you know, I just was struggling, really. Well, I'm a good guy. Y- you're not. Oh, I am. No, you're not. Nobody ever taught you to be selfish. Nobody ever taught you to tell a lie. Nobody ever taught you to steal. Nobody ever taught you to be materialistic. Nobody ever taught you to be greedy. You worked that up all on your own. Judgment is earned. How can a loving God send people to hell? He doesn't. We send ourselves. When you put the whole of our life against the holiness of God, the scales are gonna tip for everybody, 100%, every time. Judgment is earned. Now, here's the good news. Grace is free. It fascinates me. It fascinates me that Daniel brings up Nebuchadnezzar, grandpa. Because he's looking at Belshazzar, he's like, Belshazzar, the same thing happened to your grandpa. He got, he got himself judged. He went out and lived like a cow. But you know what he did that you didn't do? He humbled himself. He asked for, we would say today, forgiveness of his sin. And you know what God did? He restored your grandpa to his throne, man. He earned what he got, but he asked for forgiveness and God gave him a gift and Nebuchadnezzar finished out his rule. You proudly defied. And God would look at you and I and say, you, you know, you're in the same boat. When you read this story, the temptation is always to read the story as like, well, I'm Daniel, I'm the persuader of all truth. It's the wrong way to read the story. The way you read the story is you're Belshazzar. I'm Belshazzar. I'm drawn into the patterns of Babylon. See? Uh, Proverbs 16 and 18 is true of me. And I've earned my own judgment. Everybody has. All of sin, all fall short. Tails are, uh, scales are tipped. But the grace of God is free. It's fascinating what Peter says in chapter five. He says, guys, listen, dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another for God opposes the proud. That's what's happening between God and Belshazzar right now. God's like, buddy, if you're gonna square up with me, this is not gonna go well. He's opposing the proud, but he gives grace, unmerited favor to the humble. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He humbled down. God's like, there you go, bud. Seeing to make sure that you and I are both in the right seats here. He gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. That's exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's exactly what God wants to happen to you and me. God's not out to get you. He would have got you. You've been number weighed and divided guilty but God wishes that none would perish God is a God of judgment and wrath and righteousness and holiness and purity and truth and he is equally a God of love and compassion and mercy and grace and forgiveness and he lavishes those on people who humbly receive him. He's rich in mercy for anybody that will turn from their sins and ask for their salvation. He wants to do that. That's why he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. You know why Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world? Because he didn't need to, the world's condemned, we did it. He came to save us and to rescue us. Babylon will never teach us that. But Christ, that is his message. You know what the tragedy of judgment is? The tragedy of sin? 
is God doesn't want anybody to pay for it. You earned it. But he wants you to know that he paid for it. He paid a debt he didn't know for those of us who owe a debt that we can't pay. And the tragedy of sin and the tragedy of judgment and the tragedy of hell is it's completely unnecessary. If we'll humble ourselves before a mighty and a righteous God. Humility is something we resolve. I will yield myself to God. I resolve. I resolve to place myself under the definition and the direction of Christ. I resolve to allow the truth of God's word to define the the reality of Babylon. I resolve. We never are just humble on our own because we have a sin nature. It's not our nature. But Christ who humbled himself, who laid down his life and became nothing, he invites us to receive salvation and to be like him. Daniel chapter five, there's a warning Belshazzar is a warning. Don't square up with God. Proverbs 16, 18 is always true. But there's also a calling. If you'll learn and receive, you'll be restored. Jesus, would you help us? Lord, this stuff makes me want to cry. (laughs) The idea that the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who appoints all kingdoms and rulers, the sovereign, all-powerful God, the idea that you would allow yourself to die for our sins is an overwhelming idea. And Lord, you showed us the full extent of your love on the cross. There's just not another way to illustrate it, really. So how it must grieve you when we reject you or ignore you when you have gone to such lengths to reach to us. So God, in this moment, would you press in Would you confront us? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? Would you comfort us? Would you do whatever needs to happen in our heart for us to humble ourselves before your mighty hand? You are a holy, righteous, powerful God who is rich in mercy and full of grace. And in this moment, God, would you in your kindness push through and draw us even close to you. Do that now, God, in these still moments.